All right, you've heard the political speak around the sugar deal, sweet or sour, that's for the politicians to decide. But the facts remain unchanged. At least they have done so for about 10 to 7, seven to 10 years. Absolutely. Yvonne. It's been 10 years of trying to safeguard the sugar subsector in the country. What have we achieved with that? That is now the big debate and that is where it lies. So I want to take a look uh, at that a little bit and what sugar is coming into the country and how we're able to protect that, especially um, under the Comesa Common Market Protocol. So this is what happened in 2002. We got into a sugar protectionist uh, sort of measure that was granted for one year and the idea was that we would cap the amount of sugar that was coming into the country to plug our deficit but the aim of this was to be able to grow the sugar subsector to make the necessary changes in infrastructure and um, institute reforms like privatization of the sugar industry so we got this measure granted for one year one year later exactly we said not enough had been done the deal was extended for yet another year Let's go to 2004. Sorry, yes, to 2004. We got a second extension of these safeguards within the Comesa region for another four years. 2008, here we were again saying not much had been done during this period of time. We asked for yet another two-year extension that expired last year. That was in February 2014. Now, at this point, we again got them renewed. Now, it just kept going and going, and they've been renewed until 2017. Now, even this goes against the World Trade Organization's protocol that says, give an economy or a subsector 10 years. Beyond that, you need to start questioning whether indeed the reforms uh, are being put in place. And some of those are falling behind schedule, and they included privatization of um, the five sugar companies that are there in the country at the moment. Now, because all of this is about sugar within the Comesa, but let's take a look at trade specifically between Kenya and Uganda because this controversy then touches on the trade ties and of course um, regional integration that's the East African community um, but before we get there yes I'd like to talk about how much Uganda and Kenya are producing so Uganda produces 650,000 tons of sugar per year they're consuming just about half of that 320,000 that means they have a surplus of 145,000 tons which is why they've been saying we have a surplus and regardless of the Comesa safeguards that are put in place the fact that they have a surplus should render those an illegality and that's why they want their sugar coming into the country let's take a look at Kenya's situation for a moment we are currently producing 600,000 tons of sugar and with those Comesa safeguards we have a cap on sugar imports at 300,000 tons a year now back to what I was telling you earlier about the trade between Kenya and the countries in the region because it opens up a bigger discussion on that now as of 2014, Kenya exports to Uganda and Tanzania goods worth 105 billion shillings. The imports from the two countries combined comes to about 20, 27 billion shillings. So you can see that huge trade deficit. And these are some of the reasons uh, why they had the bilateral talks in Uganda to try and balance this trade out a little bit. So now you understand what's going on. But then let's go back to sugar for a moment. And then just look at how competitive we are in terms of production of sugar in the region. Now it costs 87,000 shillings per ton to produce sugar in this country. And this is where some say this is actually the crux of the matter. Let's compare that with just one country in the region, Malawi. Look at that, half of how much it costs to produce that here. 30 to 35,000 shillings per ton. What ails the sugar sector? Some, of course, talking about the high cost of production. These are some of the issues that we were supposed to have put in place when we asked for year-on-year -year extension of those Comesa safeguards. Of course, the poorly funded government-owned factories having aging machinery that is prone to break down. Now, we're supposed to have sold about 51% stake in the five sugar millers. A part of that was supposed to have gone to the farmers. We're lagging behind in this region. And this is why this discussion today isn't about who supports it, but it's about understanding that because consumers in general, if you use sugar, this is a discussion. Then also the implications of the trade between Kenya and Uganda and EAC integration, which, by the way, is at the heart of President Uhuru Kenyatta's legacy. This yeah. is something that he holds dear. So now we're going to be talking about the relations between the two countries, trade ties, and just what is missing from this conversation. Right now, it's not about which politician is saying what. 
it's about all of us understanding that and then holding our respective governments to account. So, of course, we want your views on that. The hashtag is Checkpoint from wherever you are watching us um, across the region in East Africa as we have this discussion with our two economists later on. Very interesting, Yvonne. I mean, if we're looking purely at the facts, then that discussion would have ended at the end oh of yeah. this. <laughs> at the end of this Super Bowl, Absolutely. we're not competitive. Therefore, we need to be able to increase yeah. our competitiveness. But laying the context, of course, is really important. Devoid of the politics that, which seems to be subjective at this time and fairly yeah. short-sighted as well. Yeah, uh, you know, just to add, we can ask for extensions only up to a certain point. Mm -hmm. We can keep saying we don't want the sugar from Uganda only up to a certain point. We can say we don't want sugar from Brazil only up to a certain point. Yeah. And so inward reflection is perhaps what is important in this discussion right now. All right. Let's move to another story, though, that 